Hey, good morning, Ben. How are you? Good morning, Steve. How are you, my friend? Good, good. Um, so I'm Stephen Wood, and I'm joined here today by my friend and colleague, Ben Pizzadlo. Um, and we're coming to you from Deep Blue Med Ed, where we dive deep into today's clinical problems. Um, and the issue of the day today is going to be uh, PPE, or personal protective equipment. Um, and as you know, that's a, it's a hot topic um, in both the EMS um, industry as well as um, you know, in, the, in both outpatient and inpatient hospital practice. Um, you know, we're now uh, a month into uh, this coronavirus pandemic here in the United States, um, and the U.S. now leads the world um, in cases. In fact, I think we have twice the number of cases as um, second place, which is Spain. Um, so that'd be great if we were in the Olympics, um, but unfortunately, we're in the midst of a coronavirus <laughs> pandemic, and so that's, that's a big Gary. issue. I'm wondering if I can share my screen here. Um, Let's see. I want to just show you the map. Taking my elderberry. Yeah. Let's see if I can. I'm not really. Well, you know what? We'll just we'll skip that. But I think everyone has access to the John Hopkins map that you can look at. That's almost real time for cases and deaths, um, and it's scary. It reminds me of a game I have. Um, I think that's called Pandemic, where you create a virus and try to spread it across the world. And it shows you exactly, you know, what this map does. Um, and, you know, when I was playing that game, I'm like, wow, I don't think this is something that you would ever necessarily see in the modern world. But now here we are, you know, seeing this pandemic. Um, so we're going to talk about PPE. I'm going to give Ben the first chance to, to talk about what his experience has been in EMS. Um, but I wanted to just give a few definitions first so that we're all on the same page. You know, first, we're talking about you know, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes the disease we know as um, COVID-19. And our understanding is, is that this is a virus that binds to um, the human ACE2 receptor um, in the respiratory tract in order to uh, enter, you know, the, the respiratory tract and causes anywhere from a very mild disease of just fever, you know, headache, runny nose, cough, myalgias, um, to, to, a, to an ARDS-like you know, disease pattern that's causing um, deaths across the world. Um, so that's what we're, our topic is today. Um, we think that this is spread by uh, droplet and contact. Um, and so, you know, when we think about precautions, um, we have aerosol precautions, which is when we have aerosolized products and aerosols are, you know, very, very small micrometer sized, you know, um, particles. We have droplets, which are usually things that are suspended in water. Um, and, you know, so like a sneeze or a cough is a droplet and it will contain, you know, dust particles, it can contain bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And we think that, you know, COVID-19 um, is spread by droplet, um, um, you know, uh, transmission. We also have contact, which is where something lands on a surface, which we call a fomite, and you might be able to come in contact with that. With aerosols, um, and we know with, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2, we think that when it's aerosolized, like through a nebulizer or, or some other um, aerosolizing process, it can be present um, in the air for about four hours. Um, droplets, uh, you know, they're, sus uh, they're subject to gravity. So uh, a droplet, when you sneeze or cough, um, it's in water and it, it should fall to the, to the ground or to a surface fairly quickly. Um, and then contact fomite surfaces. We don't really know how long, I mean, if you look at you know, uh, the data on this, it varies on the type of surface with copper being um, the least amenable to this virus and the virus, you know, quickly uh, apparently goes away when it's in contact with copper to where paper, plastic, things of that nature can be much, much longer. And the data is quite varied in that regard. Um, just to talk about particle size, because we're going to talk about masks here in a little bit, um, droplets um, can vary in size. Um, so that can, I've got a few notes here because uh, honestly, this isn't something I think about daily, um, but droplets are anything that are, that's greater than five micrometers. Um, and so, you know, that, that can vary as well. So it can be really small, like five micrometers all the way up to, you know, 350 micrometers. Um, and uh, this is going to be important when we think about, you know, mask size. Aerosols can be much, much smaller. Um, and, uh, you know, we know the actual size of this virus is somewhere around 0 0.3 uh, 
um, micrometers. So that's going to become important when we start talking about masks. Um, so just to kind of talk briefly about masks, um, you know, we have different types and we've been told to wear different types to protect ourselves from this virus. And, you know, Ben, I know you've done a lot of thinking in around this. And so I kind of wanted to open the floor up to you about, you know, what your thoughts are about the current recommendations around, um, you know, PPE, specifically masks, um, and your thoughts on that. And, um, and then you can also talk a little bit about your experience, you know, in the EMS setting and what people are using um, uh, for masks. And then we'll talk about, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So Ben, I'm going to give the floor to you. All right, thanks, Steve. That's a great uh, introduction. Um, it's a frightening scenario. I'm certainly thinking of our colleagues in uh, healthcare and EMS around the world who are in the really thick of it. I don't think, although we're certainly seeing cases, and I know you are particularly, Steve, you get a lot of credit because your hospital is designated as a, a receiving site for these patients. So you really are already seeing the surge of this. But um, I think we're yet here in Massachusetts to see the true surge that's projected over the next week or really two weeks that uh, we're anticipating. Um, as far as PPE, the thing that has concerned me the most about uh, PPE guidance for healthcare professionals and first responders, um, particularly EMS, um, you know, close contact medical care in the field and close contact medical care in your setting um, in, in confined spaces and up close to very ill patients is the guidance seems to be on a sliding scale, not dependent upon knowledge of the disease or the, the factors that you just really described so well, but depending on the availability of the supply of PPE, that seems to be the um, what's between the lines and the messaging. And there seems to be incoherence around the messaging. Um, I saw some messaging from a government entity um, indicating that EMS was okay with a surgical mask, goggles, gloves, and a gown in the back of an ambulance with a patient provided we weren't doing aerosol generating procedures like intubation or something. Um, and meanwhile, in the same type of patient, uh, a COVID patient in a hospital setting, an N95 was recommended. So um, I would offer that in the back of an ambulance, um, while it might not be as prolonged as some hospital settings, that's much more confined environment and a lot of these patients aren't managed yet. You know, they're not intubated yet. Um, uh, they, no, they're not medicated yet. Um, so at the, some of that incoherence and uh, um, kind of variability in the messaging coming from very high level federal and state uh, entities and even from some of the guidance we receive from our physician oversight is very concerning to me. And I don't see it backed up by good science. Like you pointed to some of the you, you mentioned to me before, offline before um, we started, you uh, mentioned that the past CDC guidance on, um, on surgical masks is that they provide really uh, no good protection from um, you know, aerosol, um, uh, aerosol or, or even to, to a certain extent droplet. And uh, now we're being told that we could uh, wear them and uh, that should be a, not just wear them as a substitute, but perhaps wear them instead of an N95 to preserve an N95 supply. But I haven't seen anything to really support that scientifically. Um, so Right. No, I agree with that. And, you know, um, I, I looked at an archive, you know, I, I had had an interest, obviously, as this was starting to emerge about, you know, respiratory protection, because as you mentioned, my hospital's a designated COVID-19 hospital, and I work in the emergency department, and we've been seeing these patients now for weeks. Um, and the recommendations have changed. Um, I never really, honestly, had put a lot of thought into respiratory protection, did a little bit around Ebola, um, but, you know, now especially where this is a respiratory-borne disease, you know, started looking at, you know, what are, what are these masks and what do these protections mean? Um, you know, in the archived CDC graph of what the difference between a surgical mask and an N95, um, the surgical mask is there to protect you and to protect the patient against these large droplets. Um, but really, there's no seal, they leak, uh, and they're not recommended for any type of respiratory protection. I think that's the most important statement in that is that these are not recommended for respiratory protection because these are what we're now Absolutely. being able to use. Um, you know, the, and, and then, you know, so I also delved a little bit into what is the N, what's the P, 
what's that 95 and the 99? Um, so the N95 um, means that you're gonna block out 95% uh, of any particle uh, uh, that's uh, greater than 0 0.3 micrometers in size, um, and N99, 99.97%. Um, and P very is similar. The difference between the N and P apparently has to do with whether or not it's um, protecting you against oil-based products. I had no idea what that meant. Um, but so, you know, we have, a, we have a virus that is actually smaller than 0.3. It's 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 micrometers in size, generally carried as a, as a droplet. So it's gonna, you know, the N95s and the N99 should provide that adequate protection. Uh, but when aerosolized, that protection goes away. And so I think, it, you know, when we think about what are aerosolizing um, processes, um, you know, coughing and sneezing are aerosolizing pro um, processes, um, as are you know, delivering nebulized medications. But that in and of itself, these patients are coughing, um, whether or not they have a mask on themselves that provides some protection. But, you know, I think that we need to provide the, the best protection to our, our care providers. And that to me is an N95 mask, if not N99, the surgical mask is not guaranteed to provide you that protection from an aerosolized virus. And we know that aerosolization occurs with both sneezing and coughing. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about how do I wanna protect myself, um, you know, it's at a minimum, I'm wearing an N95 mask, and then over that, I'm wearing a surgical mask. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that, one is that we've been asked to reuse these N95s, um, and we have really limited data on, on the efficacy of that. Um, and, and two, you know, I just feel it's maybe an extra barrier that you know, might help block some droplet um, before it even gets the N95 mask, so I've got that extra protection. But same, you know, as you have been told, and we're all being told across the country, you know, that the, this surgical mask is adequate, I, I have a lot of concerns about whether or not that's truly the case. I think what, the, what we need to see for data is, you know, are, are we gonna start seeing healthcare providers who are simply protecting themselves only with a surgical mask versus those who are wearing N95? Are we gonna see a difference in, you know, the numbers of those who then go on to develop COVID-19 disease? That's not how I want this data to come forward. What you'd like to see is something scientific that shows these, this is, you know, this is the protection that you need based on this data. I don't want that data to be based on, unfortunately, we had a cohort that didn't have the right protection and they got sick. And now here's our recommendation. Any thoughts on that, Ben? No, I think, I think your comment about putting the surgical mask over the N95 is really important for any uh, anyone listening in to think about um, we're not doing that yet where I am but now hearing you talk about it that just seems to make logically so much sense um, and um, you know we certainly are doing that in other scenarios like we're putting a, a surgical mask over a non rebreather for example right um, because that's logical right not because right. there's good science on it but it's right. logical and it seems um, to make sense yeah it seems to make sense but what you're describing I think makes a lot of sense what, putting a, a surgical over an N95 because it's another barrier. It's going to hopefully reduce the droplet uh, coming in and um, help preserve your N95 for longer life uh, potentially too. Um, so yeah, as far as uh, you know, I can if you wanted me to talk a little bit what we're doing at this point, I could tell you what we're doing. Um, uh, you know, um, right now our staff and this is evolving every day. There's new information or we learn something new. I think you know what you said is it's uh, true, we're kind of learning as we go, or as um, some people are putting it, we're building the plane as we fly it. Right. Um, um, so uh, not an ideal situation, but also not one that uh, you and I would have chosen. Um, so the first thing we're doing is all the usual measures, right, the, the basic stuff. Really encourage hand washing, um, distancing of employees from each other, and um, having staff oversight of that. Um, uh, and enforcement of it, um, that we're reminding them and asking them to remind us so that it's a shared responsibility because it's, we're human beings, we're social, um, and it's very, it's amazing how quickly we forget or, or, or come close to people because we want to. Um, it's a natural thing. Um, 
uh, but we really are trying to enforce those things. As far as around um, the bases, locations, everyone is supposed to be wearing a surgical type mask at all times, unless of course they're, they can't, they're eating or drinking or something like that. Um, but then they need to be distancing themselves and doing all the contact surface hygiene as well. Um, as far as response operations for medical care, um, you know, the, again, the surgical masks are on. Um, any indoor locations, um, we're donning the full um, ensemble. Any outdoor locations that are unknown, unable to ascertain, suspect or known, um, they're donning the full ensemble. The one time we might not be would be um, something like an outdoor location where we can, from st we call it stand, I call it standoff range, we call it that, where from standoff range we can quickly, safely, and appropriately ascertain that somebody is very low risk, then we'll, um, let's look, like for example, someone with a distal extremity injury from a falling off a bicycle or some other, you know, or twisted ankle from a fall, and we can uh, safely ascertain that they're low risk, we might continue with the, um, the uh, simple mask and, and mask the patient. Right. Other than doing the full ensemble at this point. Yeah. Does that sound reasonable? Or I'd I love mean, to know your thoughts on any of that. Or should yeah, we I mean, it seems less to make or? sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're all, we're now just assuming that everyone, um, you know, has the potential to be a carrier. Um, regardless of what you come in with, you have the potential Absolutely. to be a carrier. So we're requiring, you know, we're having all of our patients coming in wearing a mask and we're wearing a mask. And that probably does, you know, reduce um transmission significantly when you have both people with some type of barrier in place uh and then you know when we have patients that we do sus suspect has the disease you know we've divided our well originally we've had a division of our emergency department into non-covid and covid um, we're now finding more and more of our rooms are becoming you know potential covid um, we have a lot of uh, negative pressure rooms that have either been engineered already or we're re-engineering to become negative pressure room so we'll bring you know put a mask on we bring the patient into the negative pressure room um and you know i i think that the safest thing when you have a, a patient that you have uh, suspected covid19 is to wear an n95 to wear a surgical mask over that um to dot you know to have headgear even though that's not been recommended by the cdc it seems to make sense because people tend to touch their face and head Let's cover every you know thing that we can. Um, so headgear, goggles, like I said, an N95 with a with a surgical mask over that, gowns and gloves. And I like to double glove, um, and I also like to. Um, uh, well, I'll talk about do my doffing procedure in a minute. But so I'll I'll double glove. I have a gown. I have my masks. I have my goggles. I have my headgear. Um, and then you know when we doff, I clean my gloves off either with hand sanitizer or a wipe. Then take my gown off, rewipe my um, hands. I'll take the exterior mask off um, if I need to, uh, and or the goggles. But now lately, I've just been leaving those on for the entirety of the shift because we're going in and out of so many different rooms and so many different environments that I think you need to have this respiratory protection on almost constantly. Now, whether or not I'm you know, overkilling this by wearing the N95 all day, which I can't say is comfortable by any means, um, or not, and I could just get by with a surgical mask. It's the protection level I've chosen to do. Until someone can, you know, show me otherwise, it's what I'm going to continue to do. Uh, because like I said, you know, we, we have negative pressure rooms, but we're doing all sorts of things. We have patients intubated, occasionally on CPAP. We occasionally have to give NEBS. People are coughing, sneezing. And I also don't know what level of protect, you know, how well, as much as we'd like to have, um, you know, to, to think that our, all of our colleagues are doing the same, we can't guarantee that. So I'm just incredibly careful about, you know, my protection, touching fomites. Um, and that's what I do. Um, and I think many of my colleagues are starting to do the same. Then again, we're being told by, you know, the CDC, a surgical mask is probably fine for most of that, um, but I, I just I don't I haven't seen any data to support that, and I also don't think we know we're just we're too soon into this to really even understand, you know, all of these dynamics. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point is that, you know, lacking good data, and now we, you know, we really do work in an evidence-based, data-driven um, healthcare right. world, that we need to uh, come from that point. And, you know, the first thing they teach you when you and I became EMTs, you know, just a few short years ago, um, was scene safety, right? So, and that, right. Um, and that was the other thing that uh, I've been trying to instill in our EMTs and paramedics, and is the notion of standoff, you know, when we approach someone, even with your full PPE on, try to ascertain what's going on from a distance. I'm saying 15 feet based on the um, Cedar sinai model from the bus mm -hmm. of uh, the people 15 feet away were infected with, uh, without PPE on. Um, and then to retreat, and that's a very unusual thing for a healthcare provider to do, is to retreat from a situation in order right. to um, back off from it. But it should be the same as if we're retreating from gunfire. Um, right. And then we need to we need to kind of come up with a plan just like we would in a hazmat incident because it is a hazmat incident. It's right. a, it's the B in C B R and E, and we need to um, develop a um, unified command, a joint action plan, and then in donning our PPE, we need to um, you know follow a checklist approach yes. um, with yes. a trained observer who is preferably you know you use the buddy system with your partner, but preferably there's a third party that's um, standing off in that cold zone safe. PPE donning area, who takes you through the checklist slowly, step by step, and even more importantly, much more importantly, in the warm zone afterwards, a separate warm zone is the doffing, is in the doffing process, that very slow um, process of uh, taking the PPE off, following that checklist to a T. Right. And I think our, our friend and colleague, Dr. Sush Prusty, um, who's well known for the checklist method, I, I think now more than ever, this is an important time for checklists. Um, as you know, my yes. experience, um, you know, I, I spent 10 years as a med flight paramedic um, and every call we went on. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> every call we went on, <laughs> our pilots went through a checklist um, and many times you'd be like, wow, this is, this seems like such a waste of time. However, it, it would, it, you realize how important that checklist became because all it takes is one break in the chain and um, you can have a huge problem. And it's very much the same for PPE. Um, you know, we're donning and doffing constantly. Uh, and I'm, I'm realizing sometimes, I, I try to go through this process in my head, but I really think I'm a big fan of having a checklist on a wall if you can't have the buddy system. I'm a huge mm -hmm. proponent of the buddy system if that's what you can do. Optimally having three people there is really, you know, the probably the best way to do it a big proponent of that um you know and uh you know as many times as you think you've done this um you know one one mistake can be really you know all it takes so, yes it's very yeah. easy to touch your it's incredibly easy to um touch uh touch your face isn't it i wonder right. if people people watching i wonder how many times they've seen you and oh, I, I, I just touch my face <laughs> as you're I saying know, i saw you do it but i think no i keep doing it so yeah. it's just one of those things. I think it's 200 times an hour or something like that. Something, something absurd, yeah. Um, it, you know, that brings me, you know, I know we only have a few minutes left. So that brings me to, you know, we've had decades of this equipment out, um, you know, N95s, P, P995s, P100s, and, you know, gowns, um, just about re-engineering of, of not only our PPE, but also our emergency departments and also our ambulances. So I'm gonna, you know, I put out a little video of how I tried to avoid touching my face, um, which is just putting some tape tabs on the, you know, the ear loops, uh, because I realized like every time you went to get your mask, you're touching your face, like your dog yep. is trying to do here. Um, that was genius, I love that. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, but you know, uh, also just taking that mask off, you're touching the exterior, we need to really have some re-engineering of this PPE so that, you know, when, when we're in situations where we're reusing it, um, it's safer to use. And so um, my hope is, is that there is, you know, something in around how do we re-engineer PPE so that it's safer. Two, we need to know, can we safely autoclave or, you know, um, disinfect this? And I don't want to be, it needs to all be, does it remove the virus, but also does it have any change in the integrity? on the mask. And then third, emergency departments and ambulances, we need, you know, for emergency departments, we need to start thinking about, you know, doffing rooms, clean rooms, so that you can, you know, take everything off, 
take a shower maybe, then go and eat um, and drink and have someone cover that you know, period of time where you're gone rather than say, I'm not gonna eat today, I'm not gonna drink anything today for eight hours because I don't wanna take my PPE off and I still think that I, you know, that we don't have the optimal equipment, so I don't want to potentially risk getting infected. So we need to really rethink like staffing, break time, um, and engineering, you know, spaces so that we're going from dirty to clean. I mean, similar with ambulances, are there any negative pressure ambulances to your knowledge? I, I think everything you're talking about is, um, you know, really important. In, in America, we, uh, you know, we're a very innovative country full of brilliant people like yourself. I think that, you know, it's a very simple thing. It was a really brilliant thing. The, the tape uh, um, on the back of the um, uh, PPE to pull it off. And that's the kind of stuff that needs to be um, built into everything, right? So we should demand as healthcare providers and, and as non-healthcare providers aware of this, we have to demand that this never happens again. And right. that when we have another hundred years without a pandemic, every year should have the capacity and capability to respond to a pandemic or another catastrophic disaster, whatever, whatever shape form it comes in with uh, personal protective equipment for all healthcare pr providers and first responders, as well as the public to the extent that, that they need it, right? Uh, we have right. people out there doing very important work in our grocery stores, mm -hmm. people stocking the shelves. Um, people, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough things about the people who clean our facilities. Um, yeah. you know, whether it's They're the, the, the unsung the, heroes of all this. Oh my honestly. gosh. They yeah. all does. They all deserve a statue. They're amazing. Right. Um, so, so there's all that, but I think, you know, negative pressure ambulance, shouldn't every ambulance be required to be negative pressure at all times? I why why does it have to be a special thing? Um, right. should every paramedic EMT um, and, and, and a healthcare provider operating uh, in an intensive care and emergency environment or the like have access to um, full PPE, you know, full body PPE, including a PAPR and including the type of facilities required to be engineered by the federal government into the facility. You know, having um, a clean room, a dirty room, and a process, you know, most importantly, a checklist process from moving through that and um, giving people rest, um, food, hydration, et cetera, in order to have the capacity to take care of everyday emergencies and everyday, um, you know, healthcare situations as well as, you know, disasters. And this isn't, in, in my mind, from the modeling I've read, this isn't just a disaster, unfortunately. This is going to be, uh, unlike a peak disaster, which are tragic and difficult enough, this is a slope disaster that's going right. to sustain its um, drawdown on us over uh, on the system, on the healthcare system, the emergency uh, response system for a more extended period of time is going to be very challenging to do without these resources. So the right. lesson in it is it can't happen again, right? We have to yeah. have we have to have the capacity and the capability, and we also need accountability too for the people who allowed us to get to this point. Right. No, I 100% agree. We're going to have to re-engineer this whole process. Um, and one of the things that you know, I, I actually re recently wrote a blog about this is that. This shouldn't be something we only do during pandemics, washing hands, using good wow. respiratory protection. Um, you know, this yeah. is something that exactly. should be part of everyday practice. And it will be for me from now on out. I mean, I washed my Absolutely. hands all the time, but I never, I didn't always wear a mask when I was treating a patient with CHF or COPD um, or when we're giving a neb. That's going to become part oh. of my everyday practice. And it should be, you know, something that we carry forward. I, I, really, I wasn't always wearing a mask when I was intubating someone so that you could then land and fly them to the hospital. Right. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Same. I mean, and honestly, you know, it, and, and, you know, now I'm intubating COVID-19 patients um, and we're told this is one of the most, you know, dangerous things we can do. We've actually really engineered it. So it's one of the safest. Um, it's really all these other things that I think, you know, put us at highest risk. When, you know, I intubated a patient yesterday, we had everything we needed. I was in full, you know, I actually brought my own Tyvek suit. So I was covered head to toe. I had my N95. I had my eye protection. I had a face shield over that. Completely made sure the patient was fully paralyzed. We had a viral filter on their bag valve mask. Very slowly, methodically intubated. Ooh. Well, well, Steve, you know, you, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you, but you just yeah. mentioned that. That's an extremely important thing that we should sure. demand 
into the future is that every bag valve mask and ventilator, I don't know if a ventilator could, but every bag valve mask, it's a disposable unit, should by law, by regulation, should come with a built-in HEPA filter, correct? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, so these are things engineering changes. You know, so that was very well controlled, and I actually felt really comfortable with that. I'm less comfortable going in and out of rooms where patients have been coughing, sneezing, you know, I don't know what has been touched or hasn't been touched, what has or hasn't been cleaned. No, those, are the in, those are the circumstances actually that make me more uncomfortable is that I had more control of that intubation than I do just going into a patient's room for my first time interview of them. Um, and, you know, I so, think that, yeah, go ahead. No, but the, what you're speaking about gets to um, our latest post on um, Deep Blue is the broken arrow. Right. The broken arrow is a term from the military. And it comes from really two things. There's a, a movie with, um, with John Travolta, um, and uh, it's about um, a, a loose nuclear weapon that gets loose from, a, from, a, from a, a B-2 bomber, and the movie's called Broken Arrow. But the term actually originates from the Vietnam War, from the infantry and the U.S. Army, and it was a term used in, in a battle to describe a situation where you're being overrun, where the uh, enemy is infiltrated inside your, inside your perimeter, inside your base of operations, and the enemy um, is amongst you. Um, uh, so that's kind of what you're describing is we, we just don't know where the enemy is. We can't see right. it. We can't see the, we can't see the, um, the victims immediately. We can't see where's what's safe, what's not safe, what's kind of in between, you know, cold, warm, hot. It's, it's highly variable. And I think that's a really good point you bring up yeah. about uh, it, it being it's amongst us. So our, the importance of going slow, if I, the one thing I think of in, in doing training on this and thinking about it in all the different steps and all the things to remember, if, and we're used to moving quickly in emergency medicine, um, is we need to go slow. Right. And if we go slow, we'll be safer. We'll remember more. Um, we can also, we'll be in time for, you know, real time feedback from our colleagues, from our buddy, from our trained observer to not make that mistake of, you know, touching your nose or, or whatever. You know. Right, right. No, I, I think that's very important. And you had a great post on our Deep Blue Instagram, um, which is at Deep Blue Med Ed One, uh, that, you know, outlined Broken Arrow and your thoughts on, you know, this whole process. And so hopefully those of us who aren't following us, check that out, because that's a really important post and really brings the point home. Um, I think this is a good good discussion today. We talked about, you know, uh, PPE, specifically focusing on masks. Um, you know, we still don't have a lot of science on what we should or shouldn't be doing. I think that we need to go at the highest level of protection and then you know, maybe wean that down as we get more data, but the data isn't there yet. And so um, we want everyone to stay safe. You got to do what's you know, you feel is best for now and, and what, you know, is, is uh, you know, the best scope of practice, which I feel right now is N95 um, with a mask over that great. proven otherwise. Um, I love the mask the over it. I'm going to start doing yeah. that. I love that, yeah. Steve. It's great. Yeah. With all the other accoutrement of, you know, headgear, gowns, gloves, etc. And as you mentioned, and as our colleague, you know, Dr. Prusty would continue to hammer in, checklist for for these processes so that we're making sure we're doing it right every single time anything any closing comments ben uh just a few just thank you so much for um having me uh, steve and uh, <laughs> i always every time i talk to you i always learn about 10 new amazing things so thank you so much for that and just that um to anybody out there um you know, i'm thinking of you uh as colleagues and friends and um fellow uh responders and providers, and certainly thinking of two of my favorite places in the world, New Orleans, um, love that city, and uh, love New York City, where I did my paramedic training um, and 30 years ago, I mean, three years ago, 30 years ago, um, certainly thinking of our colleagues down there who are really in the thick of it. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for all your uh, hard work. Thank you, and, and I wanted to point out, you know, your thoughtfulness about, you know, who who is really you know, part of this process. And I know as um, healthcare providers, you know, we're getting a lot of recognition, which has been wonderful. Also getting a lot of food, which has also been wonderful. 
um, mm -hmm. and it's very helpful. But let's not forget, like you said, the people that are cleaning those rooms after we've done our job um, are putting oh, yeah. at incredible risk, as are the people making your food and delivering it, um, the grocery store, you know, employees. The list goes on for these people that are you yeah. know, being under recognized in this pandemic. Yeah, my 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 friend Leanne, uh, former colleague at St. E's, uh, wonderful uh, uh, nurse there. Um, you know, she uh, rightly points out that you know we're, although we're you know on the front lines taking care of patients, um, you know we we still have jobs, and right. uh, so the vulnerable out there are um, you know people who uh, don't have their jobs or furloughed or were vulnerable to begin with because of perhaps opiate addiction or mental illness or elderly, um, you know, let's make sure we keep them not only in our thoughts, but in our deeds and the things we can do for them. Great. Well, thanks again, Ben. Stay safe. Thanks, brother. Peace. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you from the Deep Blue Med Ed team. We'll see you next week.